A member of the local judiciary has hinted strongly about possible charges being brought against a number of individuals regarding the circulation of the information of the alleged sex act between two school children, which was made a public spectacle in the media in the past two weeks. Magistrate Ian Weeks says it was a social and moral tragedy for Barbados following this disappointing revelation. Magistrate Sweet was making that comment last evening during the launch of the Barbados Prison Fellowship Angel Tree Program for 2013 at the Cuthbert Pilgrim Hall, Moravian Gardens, Maxwell Christchurch. I believe that those persons responsible two weeks ago for what may have been published and for a lot of Barbadians who are circulating because the Barbadians who are circulating this information don't seem to understand that that is in breach of the law. You can't circulate that information. So I'm sure that some of these individuals may appear us before us in the future, so I won't speak about that. Magistrate Weeks lamented the fact that the issue of the school was made a public spectacle, noting that nothing in the school system is new. He says the school is a microcosm of the society. Any type of behavior that you see in the schools did not just happen. It would have been there before, and the tone would have been set by some of us adults. And if we continue to set those types of examples for our children, we cannot complain. As I tell some of the parents in the maintenance cases we do, do not call brass tacks and complain about the young people robbing if we are not going to inculcate certain values in them. Barbados had made progress on several fronts with respect to human rights. Over 100 recommendations have been touted for the island to consider during the recent UN periodic review for Barbados. This was revealed during a human rights workshop at UN House entitled Understanding the United Nations International Human Rights System. Senior Foreign Officer in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Joyce Bourne, says 71 of the recommendations have been accepted in full or in part by Barbados. She says successive governments have shown their commitment to the principle of human rights. As a fundamental pillar of national policy, and this has resulted in priority being placed on building an infrastructure which is supportive of the protection of human rights. Among them, the promotion of good government, governance, working towards the eradication of poverty and hunger, safeguarding the economic and social rights of the most vulnerable and marginalized within the society, including people with disabilities, and promoting gender equality and women's empowerment. National Human Rights Officer in the Office of the UN Resident Coordinator, Michel Brathwaite, says though Barbados has ratified a number of human rights conventions, the next step is to move towards implementation. It is not just enough to sign it. So one of the, one of the ways in which um, the UN monitors implementation is that states are required to file a report. When you, after you ratify a treaty, your report is usually due, an initial report is usually due one to two years after you sign it and ratify it, and then subsequently, maybe every four to five years, you then send subsequent reports which indicate the status of, of, of implement, uh, implementing the different parts of the treaty. So when it comes to the treaty reporting and implementation cycle, you know, after you've ratified the treaty, the first thing you have to do then, the state has to, has to prepare a state report. In other news tonight, a sudden death this morning at the Lime Sports Club grounds has shocked workers in the area. 49-year-old David Carter of Industry Road Bank Hall, St. Michael, reportedly suddenly collapsed while working on the field. Davidson Alling, the deceased groundman's cousin, says that David was a quiet person and was not one to mix with wild company. It's kind of sad, very sad, because a couple of weeks ago, this is about two weeks now. He went to a friend of his funeral. Uh, he was a pal bear at his funeral, and now we hear he collapsed on death now. Well, Station Sergeant Richard Boyce told CBC News there was no evidence of violence, and doctors on the scene suspect Mr. Carter passed away from a heart attack. A post mortem is to be conducted to determine the cause of death. And police are probing yet another unnatural death. Lawmen say earlier this afternoon, a man who is yet to be identified 
collapsed suddenly while walking on the pavement in the river minibus terminal in Bridgetown and died. Police on location were quick to cordon off the scene to keep curious onlookers at bay. Lawmen say no foul play is suspected. However, a post-mortem is being conducted to determine the cause of the man's death. A man is currently in custody, assisting with investigations into Wednesday's accident that claimed the life of drainage unit worker Caroline Stewart. She died on the spot after an accident involving two motor cars. The man presented himself accompanied by an attorney at law to a police station. Efforts are ongoing to identify the other occupant of the white motor car who has a dreadlock hairstyle. Well, hundreds of students of the Les Tuvon Secondary School have paid their last respects to late principal Diana Wilson, who died last month. Dale Ford has that story. The Les Tuvon School Hall was a place of sadness today. This as present and former students, staff members, members of the clergy, and the son of the late Lester Vaughan viewed the body of former principal Diana Wilson, who died last month. They offered words of comfort to each other, while some fourth and fifth form students offered a heartfelt goodbye. Rest in peace, Miss Wilson, and we will always love you. The cadets also paid tribute to their fallen principal, as Deputy Principal Sandra Goodridge lauded the virtues of encouragement and humility exhibited by Miss Wilson. What impressed me most is when she said, apply. I said, but I don't think I'm old enough. And she said, no, apply for the job. Apply for the same job that she was applying for. So we've had, we have lots of memories. We've had, got to know the families and stopped by the houses and that type of thing. So it's been a long relationship and it will be difficult to go on, I guess, without hearing some of the famous comments and the same statements and that type of thing. But we know that she is in a better place. Ms. Goodrich says students are healing following Ms. Wilson's death, noting that some have written poems and sung songs while fully involving the staff. Well, we're trying to keep things as normal as they can be, which is being very difficult. But as I said, we have lots of support. So everybody will be healing at a different rate. And we do understand that they will need more time. We have lots of memories, we have lots of footage. So we plan at a later date to have a remembrance service. We just didn't think we were able to do it at this time because it's no staff especially are just, just not strong enough. The funeral service for Miss Wilson takes place tomorrow Friday at 9.30 a.m. It is the next stage of efforts to protect Barbadian jobs and shore up the local economy. The Barbados Manufacturers Association today launched phase two of the I'm a Bajan campaign, supported by some of its partners, including Banks Holdings Limited, the Intimate Hotels Group, and Solaris. The campaign will run for the next four weeks, and BMA President Carling Nichols says that this time around, it is much more than getting Barbadians to buy local. Most Barbadians understand the importance of supporting going to the supermarket, the cashiers are more aware now and they'll ask me what do you have that's new today and they're really trying to find out what are the Barbadian products. We spend a lot of time merchandising and branding the products in the supermarket. We have a full-time merchandiser who goes to all of the supermarkets and he started many marts putting special signs on the local products so you can easily identify them because there's still quite a few products that people don't realize are made here. But we're seeing an increase in the awareness and we're very pleased to get the feedback. We do apologize, as you recognize, that is the BMA's executive director, Bobby McKay, who says she believes more Barbadians now understand how critical it is to buy Bajan in the national interest. She also confirmed that more people are buying local, a result she links to the first phase of that campaign. Most Barbadians understand the importance of supporting. You go in the supermarket, the cashiers are more aware now, and they'll ask me, what do you have that's new today? And they're really trying to find out what are the Barbadian products. We spend a lot of time merchandising and branding the products in the supermarket. We have a full-time merchandiser who goes to all of the supermarkets and he started many marts putting special signs on the local products so you could easily identify them because there's still quite a few products that people don't realize are made here. But we're seeing an increase in the awareness and we're very pleased to get the feedback. 
Now to this story. Trinidadian firm Neil and Massey has officially handed over the keys of the old Casuarina property to Sandals Resorts Limited. This was revealed by Chief Executive Officer of the Neil and Massey Group, Gervais Warner. Mr. Warner made the comment at the official opening of the Supercenter and Manning's Superstore at Warren's in St. Michael, where he also reflected on the sale of the Amund property. We had a hard time in the hotel industry, and um, we, we had to decide that it wasn't a business that we, we, we really ought to be in. But I want you to know that Neil and Massey and its uh, shareholders, its fellow shareholders, both in Amman Resorts Incorporated as well as in uh, Cass Arena, we, we took our time. And it, it, it was actually costly because we, we had to continue funding losses in these properties for, for some period of time. But we wanted to hold out for the right answer for Barbados and what would be you know at least a decent solution for, for uh, um, uh, uh, the shareholders. Mr. Warner said Sandals' presence in the Barbados market will prove to be very beneficial. I think that Sandals coming into Casimir is a very, very good thing for, for Barbados. It diversifies our source of, I see, I see our, our source of, uh, of um, uh, tourism. We, we start to be able to tap into the U.S. market a lot more. And um, I think it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a unfortunate what happened with the couples, if you, you haven't read it, but they were just unable to, to, to complete their financing and so um, you know, we created an opportunity for Sandals. But I think that that is another great example of why I have optimism in uh, the Barbados economy and I want to assure you that Neil and Massey is here to do its part in um, the economic growth, the development of people and the future of this economy. The main library at the Cafil campus has been named as part of the university's 50th anniversary celebrations. It is now called the Sydney Martin Library as sons of the late UWI administrator Philip and Roger Martin unveiled the signage. Philip spoke of his father as a man having a photographic memory and one who promoted the campus in its beginning and gained support. The Martins often said Sydney was really married to the university although mother was his first love. <laughs> As a leader with his able team, he then proceeded to transform several acres of barren land above Black Rock and overlooking the Caribbean Sea into a premier and viable learning institution, which today is a world-recognized university campus attracting students from within and without the Caribbean region. Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the Cavill Campus, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, says the library will be transformed into the Sydney Martin Library for Science and Technology. We are going to divert uh, more resources into science and technology, and already we have laid out what it's going to look like, what the new faculty would look like. Uh, we are master planning that and we're going to see Cafil gradually turning slowly like a cruise ship in a harbor to science and technology for the digital age. Barbadians seeking university and college education overseas are being reminded that they must first ensure the institutions are internationally accredited. That advice from the Barbados Accreditation Council. The BAC was one of the several exhibitors at the International College Fair at the Lord Erskine Sandiford Center. Quality Assurance Officer with the BAC, Tamara Gibson, says once requested, the Council will undertake a service called a Recognition of Service and Institution Program. And what that does is it allows us to get some background information, some information that will not be available to the public, um, to look into things like the accreditation status, the setup of the school. Uh, and the scope of the degree and give you a report on it before you spend sixty or seventy thousand dollars and realize that you know what you went expecting you actually could not get. Representatives of several of the institutions at the fair say they look forward to welcoming Barbadian students. We've had a lot of students come by um, wanting to know a lot more about our college, going abroad and things like that. Um, so I'm excited. I'm hoping to get some students. I've seen a lot more Beijing students coming to school there. Um, but yeah, it's generally one of the Caribbean islands where we get a lot of um, students. Straight to the source, a local businessman has come up with an innovative way to market his eggs. It involves a chicken and the end product, as we hear more now from Lisa Broom. 
The question is always asked, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Now, you may wonder where this is leading to. A farm, you may think. Well, not really. We're here on the Warrens to Waterford section of the ABC Highway, where we saw the operation of Mohaya Matt, the chicken farmer. Mohaya, tell us about your operation here. Uh, what brought you here? Well, I should first have a good evening, everyone. Exposure. And of course, you know, location is key. Because back in the day, you would have farmers who were egg producers who would go around to the communities and sell their eggs back in the day. But with the advent of technology and more and more people having vehicles, and we have the highway, it's easier for us to come on the highway and persons pass so they can see us. What's the response been like? Uh, most persons have welcomed the, welcomed, the, welcomed the opportunity to come and purchase eggs on the side of the road. It's a lot more convenient. It's like a mini drive through They pull up, they get the eggs, they don't even have to leave the car. And most people seem very content. Now, I notice you have here um, a brown fowl. Is this one of the layers? Yes, this is one. This is a variety of fowl called a high line. So, the, it's a marketing ploy, yes, so to less. speak. Yes. So, what caused you to actually bring the fowl out? Well, to demonstrate to the public how fresh our eggs really are. So, quality assurance? Most definitely. He explained there are different types of eggs. We offer three different types of eggs to the public. Um, a medium-sized egg. We also have the free range type egg, which is more of an organic-like type egg. These chickens, they are not housed continuously in a chicken pen. They have the option at 6 o'clock in the morning they come out. They have part of their diet, the grass, the worms, tree bark, and such like. We also give them a variety of fruits, mostly uh, papaws, water and balance because we go around with different farmers we get their produce and we give them to the chickens that's our free range eggs and we also have the ever popular jumbo eggs Ma'at said the roadside sales were all his idea I guess through traveling I've seen a lot of different people doing different little small entrepreneurial stuff and I just put them together and came up with this one well this is no foul play and with a second location on the other side of the road for people who are traveling to the north it is simply an out-of-the-pen, if you will, marketing ploy. Lisa Broom, CBC News.